charger for this laptop. Good evening, dear friends. Good evening. Welcome to the HLF online session today on Bangalore's Lal Bag, a chronicle of the garden and the city, with author Suresh Jairam from Bangalore in conversation with Nancy Adajanya from Mumbai. Suresh Jairam is an artist, art historian, art administrator and curator from Bangalore. He's a founder director of Visual Art Collective, One Shanti Road Studio, an international artist residency and alternative art space in Bangalore in India. He's currently involved in art practice, urban painting, archiving, curation, and art education. Interest in environmental and urban developmental issues influence his work. He also taught art history at the Karnataka Chitrakala Parishad, the College of Fine Art Arts in Bangalore, where he was also the principal for a few years. In conversation will be Nancy Abjanya, who is a Bombay-based cultural theorist and curator, she is, she has curated a number of major research-based exhibitions, including the Nelly Sethna. I'm sorry, it looks like I was thrown out and I've come back in. I'm not so sure where I was thrown out, but I would like to begin to talk about Nancy Ajanya who is a Bombay-based cultural theorist and curator. She has created a number of major research-based XD1, Zigzag Afterlives, 
film experiments from the 1960s and 70s in India for Camden Art Center in 2020, the Meli Gobhai retrospective, the Sudhir Patwardhan retrospective, counter canon, counter culture, alternative histories of Indian art, which he curated for the Serendipity Arts Festival Goa in 2019. Danya has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writings on subaltern art, media art, public art, collaborative art, transcultural art, and the Biennale culture in the Global South. She has recently conceptualized and led an online curatorial workshop, Once Upon a Cultural Famine, a curatorial thought experiment for the Kochi Biennale Foundation in 2021. I look forward to the excellent professionals curate a conversation about this beautiful book. It is a delight, this is the book. It is a delight to page through it. It is interwoven with urban mapping and personal anecdotes, lovely photographs, maps, drawings, botanical visuals, truly a delight. In fact, I would like to say that the book has a collectible value. Do read, do buy. On behalf of my colleagues at HLF, I thank the audience for joining us tonight. And thank you, Suresh and Nancy, for the conversation. I urge audience to post your questions in the chat box. We will raise them for you to the author at the end of about 45, 50 minutes. And I shall, Nancy and Suresh, reappear on screen as an indication thereof. And we will continue the conversation with the audience questions. Over to you, Nancy and Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Here is the book. And I, lovely. And I have one as well. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Suresh. Suresh, you must, you must put it up too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. There you go. Yeah. So th thank you, Amita, for inviting both Suresh and me to this book discussion. And uh, we are here to celebrate a very special book, Suresh Jairam's Bangalore's Lal Bagh, A Chronicle of the Garden and the City. And this book is variously a memoir, it's an archival palimpsest, and an urban and ecological history. The conflict between architecture and nature forms a constant trope in the discussions on urban form. Historically, the garden has marked a fecund threshold between these two. In different times and places, the garden has been articulated as the Vatika, the Upvan, the Chahar Bag, the Bage Bahisht, or the Jannat Ul Firdos. While metaphorically symbolizing the harmony and serenity of paradise, in practical terms, the garden has always marked a convergence of ecology and economy labor and delight, utility and beauty. At its best and most elaborate, the garden is not just simply a domesticated version of nature. Horticultural practice generates its own complex reality as Suresh shows us in his book. And that complex reality is one which uh, in involves biodiversity, experimentation with different species, and the creation of a very special sensory atmosphere. Suresh's book reminds us significantly of the role of the ruler as patron in developing the garden also as a space of inclusion and citizenship, which is an integral part of a visionary and holistic program of reform and development identified with the Badiar dynasty. And this was expressed through uh, advances in horticulture, silviculture, engineering and public works, education and support for the arts and the culture, arts and culture. <laughs> this book is a tour de force, bringing together experiences of a lifetime led in close proximity to the natural world, even at the heart of a burgeoning city. Every page takes us on a new avenue of exploration or a new trail of discovery. It is to borrow a Borgesian phrase, a garden of walking paths. With Suresh's guide, we unravel the multi-layered history of Bangalore's city garden 
and are renewed in our admiration for the patient arts of, of the gardener and the botanist. Richly veined as it is by anthropological, historical, horticultural, and autobiographical accounts, and an appreciation of the sacred in its liminal and everyday avatars, this book should be read by aspiring architects, artists, and urban and ecological historians of South Asia. With this, these very brief introdu introductory remarks, um, I'd like to ask Suresh, uh, what were the forms of research that informed the making of this book? Uh, archives, oral history, bodied and embodied research. Uh, thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you for this uh, very eloquent introduction to my book. Uh, I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. Uh, it's very important to know that this, uh, the archive or the research of this book uh, started from 2000. Uh, I was working on a project called Bangalore Mapping, and I collected a lot of information about Lal Bagh and the landscape of the city. I also had fellow artists working with me. Uh, but the interesting part is uh, uh, every time I approach the archive, there was uh, a lot of hindrance. And uh, it was because they thought I'm going to do a PhD, but uh, it was a research on the city. So I knocked many doors from the state archives to the botanical archive, which exists in Lal Park. But it is a very difficult task for most of us to approach these archives uh, for the red tape that exists. But uh, incidentally, I had a lot of friends and uh, people who were associated with it. So if there is uh, many sources that inform you about my book. Uh, firstly, it was uh, oral history from my own grandparents and my mother. Uh, we live very close to the Lal Park. So the first things I heard was that in her own orchard and in her own garden, she had an apple tree. So it was this fascination to search for this apple tree and all the associations that an apple uh, has for us today. And when I started looking for it, I did find the apple tree in a friend's grandfather's album. So it was personal archives, family albums, uh, historical records, which are there in Lal Park, and also many people who are associated with uh, the city and Lal Park opened their doors for me to access information, photographs, and maps of the city. So it was anthropological, also historical, as you say, but it was also uh, the everydayness of going to this uh, garden and seeing uh, the garden change uh, and also inquiring about certain species that were planted later on. So there was a lot of uh, first-hand research that went into making this book. And it was my own um, parents that who encouraged me to uh, visit this garden as often as possible. They thought I'll be out of mischief, um, but I think they didn't realize that I'm going to do a book on Lalpa. So it's been a lifelong um, kind of passion for me to uh, access this garden. And I always, as a child, thought that this garden really belongs to me. It was like my Amazon forest. And so I really love this garden. So that's what you see in this book. Absolutely, because I mean, that's what you feel. You, you have this visceral experience when you're reading the book, your grandfather, uh, grandmother's apple tree, for instance, which is lost and which you're looking for. So it's also like a little treasure hunt, uh, you know, through this garden city, but a treasure hunt where, uh, you know, we are not looking for any particular objects, but we're looking for memories, uh, or we're looking for historical fragments which have now been either erased or occluded. And, uh, with that, perhaps I want to go to go back a little bit into the historical genesis of the garden of the garden city. And while I was reading your book, I was also reading um, Manu Pillai's recent book, False Allies: uh, India's Maharaja, India's Maharajas in the Age of Ravi Varma, and where Pillai actually shows us that the princes weren't merely just a bunch of uh, you know decadent, exploitative rulers, uh, but some of them also saw themselves as allies of the nationalists in the long durée from the birth of the Indian National Congress to the 1920s, whether it was Tukoji Rao Holkar um, uh, of uh, Indore or Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda, they had a vision of what constituted a progressive ruler. 
And in your book, you emphasize the progressive vision of the Indian rulers from the pre-colonial to the colonial period. Rulers like Kempe Gowda, Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan, the Badiars, who despite all their contradictions and vested interests, contributed in a significant way to town planning and landscape design. Uh, would you map the, these contributions for us so that we understand, uh, as I said, the genesis of Bangalore as a garden city? If we look at Bangalore's map today, we realize that Lalbagh is in the center of uh, the city that is constantly exploding. But what is also interesting to see that this garden was located uh, slightly away from uh, the periphery of the old city. So it was on the edge, but now we look at it in a different perspective. So the first references of this garden goes to Kempe Gowda, who had a Huvina Tota. Huvina Tota is a flower garden. So the references uh, for growing flowers, the temples was a significant thing. He also had uh, installed a kind of watchtower on the hill of Lalbagh, which is the most prominent kind of insignia of the city. So this is a mantapa or a tower. So it was earlier um, uh, was seen as a kind of a, a marker of the city. So the city contained in this uh, particular landscape. So he kind of installed four, four towers and four cardinal directions of the city and the city remained in it. But now we see that these four towers are inside the city and the city is grown beyond these four towers. It also shows the growth of uh, uh, the city and coming back to Tipu Sultan, Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan, first it was Haider who got inspired to make a char bag. Uh, but later on, it was also Tipu who played a very, very significant role in trying to make um, botanizing uh, of, of the garden a very important uh, diplomatic exercise. So if we, when, we, when I read about Tipu's uh, many uh, kind of uh, dikats, so it says that it is recorded that Tipu encouraged the planting of every trees in his kingdom and used tree plantation as a method of atonement for punished convicts. And uh, his administration was involved in agricultural reforms as well. And he abolished Jagi system of land grants and introduced into the system of granting agricultural land as part of payment to his soldiers. Despite the turbulent wars he fought, his contributions to horticulture and agriculture have become a living heritage of Bangalore and the erstwhile kingdom of Mysore. And the most fascinating part is the chapter of the, uh, finding out um, this particular diplomacy, diplomacy with the French. Um, obviously, he was um, an eyesore for the British, so he aligned himself uh, and had a conversation with Napoleon. And he had sent this Mohammed Darwesh Khan uh, whose portrait you see in the book uh, to France to bring back many, many uh, mechanical things, uh, which also include clocks, binoculars, microscopes, glass makers, etc. And a uh, very significant aspect is uh, he wanted gardeners, seeds, saplings, etc., to come back to his kingdom. Uh, the most significant thing that we've forgotten uh, about Tipu is that he was. Uh, a real visionary, and he was also responsible for bringing in sericulture into Karnataka. So he had sent emissaries to Bengal and even China, and also uh, to different parts of uh, Arabia to get back uh, cocoons. And he planted mulberry trees, and this is the Mysore silk that we all talk about today, which is indebted to Tipu's fascination with silk that he found uh, through the French, but also kind of uh, contributed in many ways to acquire these different uh, plant species and make uh, Mysore its home. Then back to the Wadiyas, there were uh, very enlightened kings, and we realized uh, the Maharani, the regent queen, uh, was also someone who uh, was very, very eager to uh, kind of um, have modernity. I do have a few slides, Nancy, I want to show them to you. Yeah, that's really lovely. So. To share a screen. Yeah. So this is the book we're talking about. And
this is one of the landscapes uh, that we featured in uh, uh, in the book. Uh, it's a photograph by a young uh, uh, photographer called Sandeep TK, and uh, this is the beginning of the book. And these are drawings done by me and Mandy Ridley, a friend of mine from Australia. So a visiting artist also is part of this uh, particular book. And here are uh, the beginnings of the city, the fort and the uh, um, business district or the Peti, which is called Peta in uh, Mara Marathi. And here is also a beautiful drawing I discovered by, uh, um, by uh, this particular artist who's almost uh, unknown. So here are uh, these particular images. And the first reference to the uh, to Lalpa was this um, watercolor and etching that was done. So here are the references for the watchtower and a small enclosed garden. And uh, here is a conversation. Uh, it's not in the book, but here was an image which I got. It uh, talks about the garden, which is not public, but also private. So Lalbagh uh, was kind of a, a hub for many of these gardeners uh, who had these company homes, colonial architecture, and had these gardens around these homes. Uh, these are a few uh, extremely valuable postcards which I got from a friend, uh, Claire Arnie's father's collection. And uh, obviously the landscape says it all and uh, very extremely picturesque. So the British were finding the picturesque in this particular garden and they were trying to groom this garden to become uh, a kind of a picturesque landscape with all these references they had photographs, postcards, etc. Again, uh, these are Haider and Tipu, who we just talked about. Uh, and uh, here is Kempe Gauda, who's uh, the founder of, La of Bangalore. And also uh, he is uh, the most prominent person that we can think of uh, when, we, when we talk about Bangalore and its history. This is the particular slide I was very interested in, where we have Krishna Raja Vodiyar the fourth who was called uh, by Gandhi as Raj Rishi. And he was the most prominent uh, of the Mysore Wadiyars. And uh, in the other slide image, you have the Queen Regent Vani Vilasa Sanidana, who was a very prominent uh, queen. And uh, despite her short term of ruling Mysore, she was responsible for establishing the Indian Institute of Science and giving land to uh, this particular enterprise to the Tatas. And uh, also want to show you this very interesting painting, which is not in the book, but is part of the Mysore Kingdom's uh, enterprising and progressive look of, um, they were the first people to introduce uh, vaccines for smallpox. So Thomas Hickey's painting, which is part of a Sotheby's catalog um, is here. And it shows one of the queens showing uh, her vaccine, uh, her arm. So this was a very interesting poster for everybody to emulate the, uh, the queen and bring, up, bring about this vaccination process, which is so significant even today. Uh, but again, here is a very important thing that I talk about Krumbigal because Krumbigal was uh, my previous project. And this is a um, oil painting of Krumbigal who, who was a gardener to the Maharajas of Baroda and Mysore. So uh, Manu Pillay's work is significant here when he says that uh, many of them played a very, very positive role in establishing modernity, landscape, um, uh, urbanism, etc. And Krumigal was one of them, a German ho horticulturist who played a significant uh, uh, role in bringing the uh, cereal blossoming into Bangalore. So here is a German contribution. You, there was another German architect called Otto Kunis Berger, uh, who was uh, incidentally um, responsible for the Marg magazine and uh, with Mulkraj Anand, he established that. So he was also part of this uh, larger modernist enterprise of the Mysore Kings. So I just want to show you these images and people introducing you to these people who played a significant modernist uh, approach to landscape and, the, and specifically to Lal Park as a car. So you've delineated for us historically the role of uh, the princely rulers, uh, the horticultural culturalists, the, the gardeners, all of whom work together, the engineers, the town planners, landscapists, all of them who work together in a synergy. 
to bring about changes in, in, in this garden city. But I was also thinking that apart from the master narratives, which talk about uh, you know, uh, tropes of pow power, authority, authoritarianism, the garden which is gridded, uh, and uh, you know, which, which has this kind of Renaissance perspective, a sovereign perspective over its citizens. Um, from that master narrative to the little narratives, uh, where you, know, you have the Malis, for instance, and did, I mean, were there instances where you, know, you, you had a special relationship between a Mali and a, and a European uh, horticulturalist, culturalist, and were they able to exert their agency in any way? There's uh, one narrative I remember that one of the first directors of Lal Park, Cameroon, uh, was very interested to introduce different kinds of seeds to the gardeners and the uh, kind of farmers of the city. So he brought in uh, a lot of South American vegetables. One of them is called coyote, which is a kind of a vegetable and in the local uh, languages called Bangalore brinjal. It's gre green in color and it it uh, is, is a kind of a local favorite. So uh, there was uh, an instance where Mr. Mr. Cameroon used to go around on horseback distributing these seeds and asking farmers to grow them. So here was a kind of a, uh, a, a small narrative uh, that talks about how uh, the directors were bringing in plants from different parts of the world. Obviously they bought in the apple seed and uh, apple sapling, but many, many different uh, cash crops because ba uh, Lalbagh was also a hub for economic botany. So coffee, um, teak wood, mahogany, and uh, they were very, very interested with tobacco uh, and many, many uh, fruits which were introduced into Bangalore because of this, its climate. So there was a constant uh, kind of conversation happening with not only the Malis of Lalbagh, but also the farmers who were associated around Lalbagh. So there are a lot of small nurseries around Lalbagh and some of them uh, were uh, my relatives who still have these small nurseries and they had a, a, a lot of uh, exotic trees and plants which they specialize in. So here, is a, uh, here are these narratives which had uh, uh, the British trying to have a conversation with the local farmers who were growing what they wanted, including roses. And uh, these, some of these roses are still exported to different parts of India and the world. I think that's what's also interesting about your book is, book is how you shuttle between the macro and the micro histories. Towards the end of the book, I remember uh, you talking about Rajamma, uh, which yeah. is about contemporary time. Uh, she runs a kind of little cottage industry where she collects the flowers from the wholesale uh, suppliers and then gives it to uh, these um, uh, homemakers. Uh, women who then make these malas, garlands, um, you know, between their uh, various domestic uh, chores, and um, and you so rightly talk about how it's 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 almost like, and when when they are threading these flowers, it's 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 like um, you know saying a prayer, it's uh, it's what we'd call a japa. So I think that again, uh, I mean. It, What's really lovely is how you will will you know speak about uh, a narrative that talks about uh, you know the history of empire and then you know suddenly you're actually talking about something that's inward looking uh, uh, you know and and um, and and which provides a kind of liminal threshold and that's what also gardens do they provide that liminal threshold on the one hand you have sociality and then you have that possibility of becoming something else. Um, You're very right. Uh, instantly, I bump into Ra Rajamma almost every day. And uh, she wants to give me flowers for, uh, for puja, which I don't do, but I just take it from her because it's like a gift from the garden. And uh, it's important to have these uh, anecdotal narratives which have, which have peppered my book to bring in the personal and the lived experience of owning the city and the garden as part of my uh, language. Also, what I, uh, what I like about um, the visual mapping of the book is uh, uh, the photographs with your sister, uh, you know, which are extremely tender. And then, of course, there's these beautiful photographs of your mother. And uh, there's this constant uh, feeling of, uh, you know, uh, of, of inhabiting long shots 
and but even within those long shots there's a sense of you know of of being uh, proximate to a certain point and then being very distant so it's it's also the way the book shuttles uh, you know with uh, with trying to uh, narrate details in close up historical details in close up and then suddenly giving you the macro picture uh, giving you an aerial shot and especially with the, the photograph of your mother and sister and and the narratives that you talk about making garlands for them plucking flowers uh, even little things like garden gardening tools which were invented uh, indigenous tools which were invented uh, perhaps in, in, again in a synergy between uh, you know the, the british horticulturalist or, uh, or culturalist or, or engineer and the local the gardeners the farmers so i do have some slides which i'm going to show you from my family album uh, here is mr jabaraya who actually uh, is the proof of the apple tree existing in bangalore Uh, he is a friend harish padbanaba's great grand, uh, fa- grandfather and he is one of the first queue trained uh, directors so uh, all the baton was handed over to the locals to take it further uh, rao bahadur J- jabraya is also responsible for starting flower shows in new delhi so uh, from karnataka is somebody who starts flower shows in new delhi i also want to show uh, this idea of the glass house but i think it'll come in another conversation uh, but here are the photographs of uh, the family which i wanted to talk, uh, talk about uh, these are my grandparents and my uncle and aunt who were the seniors of the family who were the last farmers so it is the first pictures that i saw which was very really fascinating that they had gone to a colonial uh, uh, studio to take these photographs dressed in all their fineries and uh, the women i think it's a matriarchal um, <coughs> family where the women are quite prominent or they're standing erect and you see my grandfather there was wearing a mysore uh, turban and here are the photographs you were referring to uh, all of them are courtesy my father who was an amateur photographer and me standing in a distance uh, uh, as part of the landscape of lal bag i we uh, the editors uh, sarsija and uh, uh, roshan who helped me put this book together were very keen to add this photograph all photographs i was very shy to put in photographs of my family in it uh, but i think they really strike a chord with many of them uh, because the landscape has changed and i've grown and everybody else is uh, uh, part of this journey of looking at the landscape in different ways so these are the few things which i wanted to show and i'm i'm happy you brought in the the, the family album uh, because uh, as you said it it strikes a chord with the readers with the people who made the book in the first place your editors your illustrators and and and, and others and i was also thinking in terms of uh, you know the how your family came to bangalore in the first place so uh, as we know bangalore is nourished by the contributors of uh, of its of its various migrant populations and uh, you yourself belong to a community of farmers who migrated from tamil nadu and then settled in the garden city um so what happened in bangalore for instance um, had wider uh, historical resonances in mysore hubli the bombay and the madras presidency and um, i read elsewhere about how kempe gowda who you brought up in the discussion uh, had who, who and who laid the foundations of the bangalore city came from a kannada speaking community but he wrote a yakshagan uh, uh, play in telugu so could you also talk about your family its occupational linguistic and cultural ethos and its contribution to the greening of this multilingual and multi ethnic uh, garden city and uh, this is uh, very personal but also very significant uh, to know that i come from a multilingual family uh, my both my parents spoke five languages mm. so uh, it was part of the family tradition to know telugu tamil kannada mm. uh, not much of malayalam but uh, urdu also mm. so they were fluent in all these languages and uh, i did not have a specific mother tongue and uh, the cosmopolitanism of this particular city was such that we ended up speaking many of these languages uh, with each other and with others around us so i stay in a locality which is uh, extremely cosmopolitan where you have a shia and sunni mosque in the same place almost uh, 100 yards away and you have uh, uh, diff- 
different communities of people from Sindhis, Marwaris, and uh, other people from North India who made Sh uh, Shanti Nagar their home. And uh, my house also is like an open house for many of uh, the different communities to come in and explore. So uh, back to the story of uh, migration from Tamil Nadu, the only stories I hear are anthropological stories of the Tigala community that came in. And one of the most prominent uh, festivals is the Karaga festival, which where um, it is like the uh, festival of a city, the Jatra of a city of Bangalore. So this is a very significant role where the market gardeners uh, play a significant role and they worship uh, uh, Draupadi as the mother goddess. So this is a very, very uh, interesting story where the presiding deity of the particular family temple is uh, the Pandavas and Draupadi as the mother goddess. So, and uh, this brings in a very interesting, um, I mean, um, larger narrative of how Draupadi is seen in Southern India as a mother goddess, a goddess of born from fire. So uh, iconographically also, it brings in a very ancient Dravidian narrative into um, the, uh, the city's landscape as the, the Karaga becomes a significant thing. I also mentioned that the Karaga festival has a connection with the local Darga. So it becomes another kind of trajectory where um, the local Muslim population also respect the Karaga a festival that happens and the Karaga goes to the Mastan Sahib Darga to offer uh, flowers and they exchange offerings. So this, these things are extremely rare and part of the uh, kind of uh, cosmopolitan fabric of Bangalore. Uh, and I see it still existing and um, in, uh, in a very, very special way, especially in tradi traditional families that are part of the older city. I think that's that's what's really wonderful about it because it's 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 constantly highlighting relationships that uh, bear the stamp of multiplicity, plurality, and um, you're always talking about various kinds of diversities. That's biodiversity, ethnic diversity, uh, again uh, gender fluidity through the trope of the Karaga festival yeah. and the man becoming the goddess, uh, you know, bearing a beautiful jasmine crown. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, you know, I mean, all these little detours that you take in the book, uh, it's, it's also like classical music, you know, you're beginning, beginning with an alap and, uh, you know, you begin on a particular note, you leave that, then you come back and you elaborate uh, it. Um, and also uh, something else that I was sharing, that I shared with you earlier, which is the surge nature of the book, because there's no jargon in it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you, you are not, uh, you know, I mean, basically giving us a narrative about uh, what's, what's happening today in the age of the capitalocene or, or the anthropocene. Uh, it, uh, there, there, is, there, there are no generic formulations here. This is a very much um, what Walter Benjamin would call, you know, felt knowledge and felt knowledge, which then gently weaves um, alongside historical knowledge to create a third thing. And, um, you know, since since in the book you are constantly talking about diversity, uh, do you think that um, that that diversity has as uh, as today has frayed edges, uh, uh, and 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 uh, do you do you see the manifestation of those uh, frayed edges um, within the within the garden city that you inhabit? There are many in uh, there are many instances of uh, I mean riots and. Not many as we see in the North, but there ha they have been certain problems. But at large, when you look at Bangalore, it's a very peaceful city. And it, uh, it has a certain diversity and cosmopolitanism, not only botanically, but also in terms of its uh, uh, people it attracts. It's, I think it attracts the brightest minds uh, in science and technology. And many people have made it its home because not only because of the weather, but, but also because of the kind of uh, the friendly nature of uh, the Kannadika. So who's always welcoming and opening uh, his home to others. So here is uh, a city that is uh, still not close to the others. And I think uh, you, you could find every kind of cuisine you want to in the city uh, because of the kind of acceptance that the city has always had. 
I think it, these are the seeds that have been sown uh, botanically, but also socially. Uh, you can look at it as a large quilt with uh, like a patchwork quilt and they all exist together. And what brings us together is, I think, uh, community, living together, uh, accepting one another, and uh, also sustaining these uh, long traditions that are part of uh, living in a city like Bangalore. And to just go back historically, about uh, Kempe Gauda's um, uh, you know, initiation of plantations, uh, plantations of you know, flowers and uh, fruits and vegetables, which would then feed all the commercial hubs that he had set up. Um, so uh, 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 in your book, you talk about how uh, he also constructed water tanks and uh, he, he, uh, he was very forward looking and, and he wanted to also preserve the sacred groves, the forests. Um, and then you segue into uh, Hyder Ali and uh, Tipu Sultan's uh, model of, uh, of, of, of the garden, the Chahar Bagh which then is, is this kind of enclosed garden. So, uh, so you, and then you move on to the botanical garden uh, in, the, in the colonial period. And, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and you talk about different degrees of access and, um, uh, access and, uh, and, and, and restriction on entry within the garden. So uh, today in contemporary times, uh, how, how do you sort of see this ratio of uh, access and restriction? Uh, it's, in a, it's a, a interesting thing is just not Lal Park, which also the other gardens in the city. Uh, now the government takes the role of uh, regulating entry and exits. Mm -hmm. So Lal Park is also a joggers park. So the joggers begin their walk around 4.30 in the morning. So the gates are open. So the joggers don't pay an entry fee. And after nine o'clock, you start paying an entry fee of 25 rupees. It's very cheap, but still it's it's not accessible to everybody. So a garden has been walled. So it has four gateways and four cardinal directions. So access to people is not very easy. So it's always regulated. And there are people who kind of still pluck grass, sometimes flowers, and also offer uh, puja to the lake. So these are the transactions that have been, and the wall has restricted these kind of social transactions. And there's a regulation of security, uh, and there's also timings. It closes at 7 p.m., and uh, everybody is asked to leave. The gates are locked. Uh, so the government plays a role where it regulates entry and exit to the garden because the garden has become a botanical cosmos. And this is also because of uh, its... Uh, uh, kind of reputation as one of the important gardens in India or Asia for that matter. So the government plays this role, the horticulture department takes very, uh, plays an important, uh, I mean, regulatory system that is there, it locks things up and access is constantly regulated. It's no longer a tota or a, it's, a, it's like a English garden or a government garden. Mm -hmm. And um, also in, in terms of the threats that Lalbagh faces today uh, because of hyper-urbanization, could you also uh, talk about that, that contemporary matter? Um, the threats are, I think the only threat I see is vandalism and uh, public negligence, uh, littering. Uh, these are the threats. There are no threats for the land because the land is walled in the, in the 50s. Uh, Lalbag has a solid granite wall and it's, it's been like that for a very long time. But it's the people and, uh, and the kind of way they use this place. Littering is a big problem in Lal Park, And I feel uh, this has to be regulated. And also uh, people selling a lot of uh, edibles. And I think if they sort this out, Lalbag will be much uh, cleaner today. Maybe we could just go back historically to this, the, the trope of the glass house. Okay. Uh, because um, again, in, the, in your book, you perform a post-colonial critique of the, of the glass house um, uh, you know, as it manifests itself uh, in the first uh, World Fair, uh, the great exhibition of, um, of 1851 yeah. uh, in the Crystal Palace exhibition. And um, I was just thinking about how Paxton uh, you know, was an engineer and, um, and, um, and, and a, a landscapist and a gardener, 
and uh, and I found thought that this is affinity between you uh, and, and 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 your whole family ethos and your memories related to the Garden City and uh, the, the 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 initiator of the Crystal Palace, who was himself um, a gardener to begin with. So here are a few images uh, which you see and uh, the kind of references the glass house has to the Crystal Palace. And incidentally, a very interesting story is that the Crystal Palace was inspired uh, by the Amazonian lily pads. Mm. So you have that uh, the veins of the lily pads that keep it afloat and even uh, you and me could stand on this. So here is a botanical inspiration for uh, the Crystal Palace, which was replicated of more than 100 years ago in Lal Park and has become a kind of landmark for uh, everyone, not only in the city, but uh, all over India. And every time either Gandhi or Nehru or Mrs. Gandhi came to uh, Bangalore, they, were, they all had meetings in the glass house. So it's not historically, politically, socially very significant. I also had many friends who said their parents were married here and they had wedding receptions. And the Qadri brothers from Pakistan had the Kawali Kaval, uh, performance here. That was one of the last events. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, it, became, it was a social space. Uh, also, but now uh, there is restrictions because of a larger public that comes into uh, this particular place and they are unable to regulate um, um, people pouring into this place. So the two flower shows are the most significant uh, uh, events, uh, one happening during the Independence Day, the other happening on the Republic Day. So these bring a lot of people from all parts of India and the world to see this uh, uh, particular um, horticulture shows. Mm. I think that's why it's so uh, important also when we're talking about these uh, master narratives is that along with the master narratives, there's always the side story of the Adakatha. For example, Paxton, uh, you know, he, he actually, uh, which is something that I teach in my class on art history as well, that he changed his, um, his floor plan uh, because, and, and the blueprint of, of the Crystal Palace because he wanted to conserve these majestic elm trees. And, and therefore he made uh, you know, changes in the architectural plan to do so. So again, uh, you know, I mean, history is always full of contradictions. While on the one hand, it's all about classification and control uh, and, and, and exerting authority. On the other hand, there are also these little actions that are made by people uh, in, in, in power uh, to save the, the small but significant things that, are, that matter to all of us on this planet. That's really fascinating to know about uh, the tree in the center of the Crystal Palace. I was wondering how it came there. Uh, and also the, uh, the references of how most of the time the glass house is like a vitrine mm -hmm. and uh, um, you don't see uh, it full of flowers or uh, plants because you are like a specimen inside the glass house and looking at uh, the trees and flowers outside of the, the glass, uh, glass vitrine. And also glass house becomes important because it creates a kind of axis and it kind of erases the memory of Tipu in one way because we see that there is no reference historically of Tipu unless a small flag which talks about Hyder and Tipu's contribution. The glass house becomes the most prominent colonial edifice for the British to establish their supremacy over the native land. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, not only um, uh, uh, archi uh, an architectural edifice, it's also a political kind mm -hmm. of statement that British is making in a, mm -hmm. in a garden. No, absolutely. It's a statement, it's a spectacular statement on empire, yeah. uh, industrial advancement. And that's what it actually was. I mean, it, with all these different colonial powers competing with each other to show their wares. Incidentally, it was uh, earlier called uh, Albert Victor Conservatory. Mm. It, they are, uh, you obviously would have seen the Queen coming to mm. Love Park and inaugurating mm. uh, the Flower Show, which is another prominent uh, mm. kind of historical record of uh, mm. the empire. Mm. And um, uh, something else that I wanted to uh, ask you was, uh, since we are talking about gardening throughout this uh, discussion, is uh, how you, in a way, 
uh, patiently uh, tend various art practices that, uh, that, that you invite into your um, artist residency at One Shanti Road. And um, how, how do you see your role as artist, art historian, curator? Uh, I mean, uh, next year it's going to be 20 years of uh, Shanti Road. Mm -hmm. So it has been um, uh, almost, I mean, uh, I could say like the trope of the garden. Mm -hmm. So many species, many people come and go, uh, they get rooted in the city. So uh, the Bang uh, Bangalore's introduction happens through a walk in Lal Bagh, uh, through Shanti Road for every artist who comes here. Mm -hmm. So when it became a, a residency program with, mm -hmm. uh, with the collaboration of the Goethe Institute and other uh, cultural spaces like the Pro Helvetia and all that, uh, we realized that the first introduction for the city was, was Lal Park. So many of these people have come here and have uh, kind of made um, their visit more rich through walking in Lal Park. But at the same time, I also see uh, my role as uh, uh, somebody who lets things be, uh, be open, welcoming, non-judgmental, and uh, to people who come to the city, especially artists, and make space for art. So this has been uh, uh, my kind of vision for uh, an open space uh, for the arts, and I've been able to sustain it uh, thankfully because of this many people who've been part of this journey. So I also see it like uh, one of the images I, I, uh, I have here, which I'll show you all. I think it's uh, the image of uh, um, the galaxy of musicians of Ravi Varma, which is in Mysore, which is uh, um, a, a pre-independence uh, uh, kind of uh, painting. But at the same time, uh, the people who come here also, and that, the, the other image is of a lot, many dancers and musicians performing a contemporary dance. Uh, and I see this kind of similarity of uh, the space uh, attracting a lot of people who, and who are talking to each other, having conversation across cultures, and also uh, creating new uh, works of art, whether it's theater or music or an installation. So it has been a laboratory. Lal Bagh has been a laboratory of nature. So I think Shanti Road is like a laboratory where sometimes they're even allowed to fail. So this is um, very, very coincidental. Yes, to both grow and to fail. Uh, and on that note, um, we request um, Amita to take the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. This, this was such a meaningful conversation. This was such a eloquently uh, choreographed um, uh, conversation. Thank you so much for those very lovely questions. And uh, there are there are responses right here in the in the chat box on the YouTube where people have gathered. There is one person, Lynette, who is logged in from Switzerland. Um, and saying how much she's enjoying this um, session. Um, there is a question from Professor Ismat Mehdi, who is asking, thank you for this fascinating account. And she asks, she's wondering why the place is called Lal Bagh. Does one know? Uh, this is a question that is often asked uh, to me and to others. Uh, they say that, uh, some people say, this is again oral history, they say Haider Ali's mother was called Lal B. And uh, the other word in Urdu for, for dear is Lal. So this garden was dear to many, so it could be Lal Park. And the flowers, the roses that grew in this garden uh, is something that got its name, so Lal Bagh. There's a Lal Bag in, in uh, Bombay, which Nancy uh, knows. And uh, that also has uh, a similar name. So I feel it's the dear, dear garden, or it could be the name of somebody. But I think it's also because of uh, uh, these multiple oral uh, histories that have come to us, it's called Lal Bag. I'm on mute, I realized. Kapila Nahinder um, uh, said something very nice about you, Suresh, and I think uh, particularly in the context that Nancy raised in 20 years of 
one Shanti wrote, she says, the beautiful inclusion of all cultures that converge in this wonderful work of, of art epitomizes the inclusive nature of Mr. Suresh Jairam. Thank you, Kapila. I think, yeah, that's, that's very beautifully, beautifully raised. Yeah, somebody wanted to know the name of your parents and grandparents, Suresh. Okay. My, my mother, who was a doctor, is called Lakshmi. My father is Jairam, so I take his name. I, we avoid surnames, but because it was referring to caste earlier, but now I'm Suresh Jairam. Uh, my grandmother was called Krishna, and my grandmother was called Varadappa. So uh, these are the names I know. I don't know my great grandparents' name. I only know that uh, when everybody asks me, where is your hometown? I had to say it's Bangalore. Yeah, that's, that's lovely. Are there, you know, you had other slides, uh, Suresh, that we did not cover. Is there something that you'd like to include from your end that, there uh, were, that you would uh, I think I showed most of the slides, and okay. uh, and as it referred to Nancy's questions, I jumbled here and there, and, mm. uh, but I think I showed most of them. Okay. okay. Uh, you also have some very beautiful botanical illustrations. Yeah, I can show you those illustrations. Talk about yeah. the artists who made them. So there is a, a, a very important uh, uh, artist. I'll try and. Uh, get to the slideshow. Uh, these are the botanical drawings. And uh, these are made by one of the most important uh, painters who was basically a Mysore painter, which is an icon painting tradition, which most of you are familiar with. But here is, I think, the best botanical drawing, which is totally neglected and has been hidden in this archive of uh, Lal Bagh. And uh, Chelovaya Raju is the name of uh, um, the artist. And he has, he's responsible for these incredible uh, drawings. And I think they are more than 1,000 in number. So here are, uh, look at the grace of this Karela. And, uh, or even this, uh, the lotus. He is a master, forgotten master, and needs to be acknowledged. And I think I, I, I'm, I don't do justice by adding a few images in my book, but I think there, there can be a book on Chalovaya Raju's botanical drawings, uh, which is yet to come. I hope somebody does it as, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I think he's a really uh, forgotten master, uh, and he deserves great praise. And many of his works are there in the Kew Garden Library. And have there been exhibitions of his works? Never, never. Even these images are uh, uh, taken um, when it, these uh, pages were restored. Uh, so they're not published, they're unpublished uh, botanical drawings. Uh, where are they? In, in the government archive? Or? Yeah, they are in the Lal Bagh archive. Okay. And which is difficult to access, I... Uh, Unfortunately, yes. So uh, this book is also uh, a kind of, um, uh, it gives you hope in terms of how in the, in the place of an absence of an archive, one could still work and access material and uh, somehow create something that is, could reach out to others. So my hope is to create a curated show with botanical inspired drawings and maybe artwork. Uh, and also make this book into an exhibition sometime if it's possible. That, that would be lovely. Yes, that would be very, very lovely. What a lovely thought. My colleague, Professor Vijay Kumar is asking, um, Suresh, how do we balance government patronage and regulation? Also, how much of Lal Bagh is indigenous and natural and how much is deliberately cultivated? Does one know that? So 20% uh, of Lal Bagh is still wild uh, and the rest is all uh, landscaped. Uh, I don't want to use the word cultivated, but it's properly landscaped. In terms of uh, government, uh, there are a lot of rules and regulations for the directors to follow. 
uh, almost uh, more than 100 people work in Lal Park. So it's, it's a very big uh, organization. The horticulture department has a lot of work on its hand. Um, they are, they incidentally, there were all, there are also spaces where they create uh, laboratories for acclimatization for insects, for pests, etc. So they also uh, agriculturally involved also. So it's just not a botanical garden for the aesthetics of it. Uh, they also are part of the distribution of fruits and vegetables in the city of Bangalore. So they act as this via media between the public and the government and the farmers. See, you cannot um, duck the red tape uh, in uh, the government officials and government bodies. So uh, if there is a way I need, uh, you need to create uh, maybe friendships that could, uh, that could open doors or maybe a small window to let the light in. Wonderful, very nice. The very last paragraph in your book is very moving and I'd like to read and I'd like you to talk about it. Um, and maybe this could be the final thing. Nancy, are there any questions that you would have raised and I kind of came in too early? Please. Okay, okay. That's okay. Yeah. You say on the last page before you close the book, you say, I, I even now stop to admire the beauty of the tree-lined avenues and verdant parks beyond the nostalgia of times gone by. And as the city becomes an adjective, Bangalore, we enjoy the shade today because someone planted a tree long ago. Take a deep breath. You're still in this eclectic botanic cosmos. This is so beautiful. So do you still do this? Do you still walk around and take in this cosmos? And uh, you mentioned that, you know, um, when the going is, going is, and, and, and I'd like you to read the rest of it as well. Uh, when the going is rough, this is where you go and find your peace. Uh, this garden in the middle of the city is a paradise, a resort for the community temple of the mind, spa for the body, and a clinic for the soul. It is here that we can safely place our hope when all, when all else is lost. So uh, coming to your question of who I, I almost go to Lalbagh every day. So there isn't a day. It's like my, maybe that's my morning prayer. Mm. That's beautiful. That's very beautiful. I think that deep connect with nature, that deep connect with history, with your personal history, of course, because you grew up in that area. I think it just oozes out through this, these pages, these visuals. And um, I wish many of us could, you know, talk about this little spaces and particularly green spaces where you can still go and know that all is not lost. Um, that's, that's, that's a very, very deep connect. Thank you so much, Suresh, for writing the book. I think that's, that's the, the first thing. And then, of course, to readily agree, uh, I must thank um, Gunwanti Balram for this. Um, yeah. uh, by the by, um, she mentioned yes. it. She says, yes, a common friend uh, of many years ago, many decades ago, as with Nancy, of course. And it's so wonderful that while the medium of online is not the very best, uh, but it does offer this possibility of reconnecting and spending an hour together to, to reminisce, um, learn, and to, to travel along with the writer. And of course, in this case, the uh, curator and, uh, and um, Nancy, who was in conversation with you. Thank you so much, Suresh, and thank you so much, Nancy for this very, very beautiful um, conversation and discourse. And uh, yes, uh, uh, Suresh, when you have this online, uh, this exhibition offline, um, we would love you to bring it here to Hyderabad as well. I hope so. I also want to add uh, um, a word of thanks Please. to Nancy and Ranjit. Both of them uh, wrote so eloquently about this book. I was really floored. 
it really made my um, made this book uh, what uh, it deserves i don't know what it deserves but i was so happy to get this uh, short reviews from both of you and i'm very grateful Wonderful. Yes. Greetings to Ranjit and thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Suresh. And greetings, Gunvanti. You may be there in the in the YouTube. Thank you to all our audience who was who was who were part of this evening uh, on behalf of my colleagues as well as as well as all the audience. I once again thank Suresh and Nancy. Uh, we have one more HLF Online coming up to end this year's season of HLF Online. My colleague will put it uh, up in the poster in a minute. Um, we will then prepare for the uh, HLF Festival, the Hyderabad Literary Festival 2022. Uh, that will be the 12th edition. And we look forward to having some of you, all of you, uh, from January 28th to the 30th, um, uh, we will we will circulate the information. Here is the um, information for next next session. Thank you so much, and have a very wonderful evening, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.